Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, coming to you from the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, resuming our study today in verse number 20. Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 20, beginning in just a minute. Get your Bible if you can, and uh, as you are, I'll tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. I talk about this on every broadcast because it's so important, because I have a passion to get out the Word of God from Genesis through Revelation. This has been my life work for over 30 years, teaching the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, not a survey, not a chapter by chapter, not a paragraph by paragraph, a verse by verse, just like we will be doing today through the entire Bible three complete times. There is no substitute for the Word of God. And like Paul said, I have not ceased to teach you the whole counsel of God. All 66 books of the Bible are important. All the verses are important. So study them at your pace, at your convenience, at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And by the way, while you study, jot down any questions you, that you might have, Bible questions, and send them to me or e email them to me. That's even better. And I'll do my best to answer them either personally in an email to you or uh, and, and I normally do that. Otherwise, uh, one of these days, I'm going to put together a series of programs on questions and answers because I love Bible questions. It's just another way to dig into the Word of God. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Proverbs 16, beginning in verse 20. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. And you know what it means to trust in God? And there is no substitute for this. If you're looking for happiness, if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for a deep-seated joy, you won't find it unless you put your trust in God. And putting your trust in God, if you want to be happy, put your trust in God. That means... Do what is right in the eyes of God. That means obey his word. Don't compromise the principles, the commands, the word of Almighty God. And trust that he will take care of the consequences. Not trust that he will give you what you want. But obey him and put your life in his hands. And trust him to do what he knows what is best. And to allow what is best for your long-term spiritual good. Now, it might be not be your first choice, but that's part of trusting God. Trusting God is obeying God and leaving the future and the consequences to Him. Even if it means you lose friends, even if it means you lose a job, even if it means you lose a pension, even if it means you lose income, even if it means you lose family, don't put anything before God or you're not trusting him. Obey him, no matter who likes it or doesn't like it. Obey him and trust him with the trust him to take care of you one way or the other. Leave your life in his hands. If you can't leave your life in the hands of God, well then I, then I don't know. If you can't trust God, I don't know who you can trust. And you got a problem trusting. But notice verse 20 again. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. The most important instruction is to listen to God's instruction from his holy word, from his written word. Not from some joker who comes up to you and says, God told me. Somebody comes up to me, and mark this down. Anytime somebody comes up to me and says, God told me that you're supposed to be this or that, I always ask them to do the, uh, the works of a prophet. You better do a miracle if you expect me to listen to you. And by the way, I've never heard anybody, I've never seen anybody do a miracle, and I don't listen to those people because I've got the Holy Spirit and I've got the Word of God and God can lead me just fine, thank you. I don't need a third party to micromanage my life. 
And I, there's some pastors, used to be called shepherding, I think, years ago, who were micromanaging their people's lives. That's probably another fad that has gone by the wayside. Hopefully it has. Something's always there to take its place, so. But don't buy it. The most important, important instruction, really, the only really, really very important instruction to follow is God's instruction from his holy written word. If we follow what God says in his word, trusting that he knows what's best, even if we don't understand why, then we will be happy. Then we will be blessed. Trusting God. Now, let me correct some people's thinking about what it means to trust God, okay? Okay? Trusting God is not winging it in a mindless attempt to get what you want. Well, I'm going to trust God for a better car. Well, good luck, buddy. Because although that sounds pretty, pretty pious, where in the world, in the Bible, does God promise Christians a better car or more material possessions than what we have? And if he doesn't promise those things, then you are not exercising faith. You are running on a wish. That's not faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can you trust God to give you something if he hasn't said he's going to give you something? You're just winging it. You're running out of wish. Do you see that? And this is important too because people say, well, I'm trusting God for a new car. I'm trusting God for a different job. Well, pray to God. He might give you that different job. He might give you that different car. Yes, absolutely. But don't say you're trusting him for it because he hasn't said he'd do it. And then all of a sudden he doesn't do it. And you've been telling people they've been trust, you've been trusting God. And, then, and people start thinking, well, God's not trustworthy. No, you were foolish to say you were trusting him. To give you something he, he never said he would. Just because you want something doesn't mean you can trust God for it. If you ran around and said, well, I'm trusting Moret to give me $10,000. Well, you're going to have a long wait. And I guess I'm going to be discredited. Because I never promised you 10,000, believe me. See what I mean? People do that sort of thing to God. People say, well, you know, I'm, I'm standing by faith. I'm trusting Mike to buy me a steak dinner tomorrow night. I'm believing Mike for that steak. Yes, but Mike has not promised a steak. So how can you believe me for that? I will tell you what trusting God is, okay? Just so you get this again. It's obeying his word, even if it costs you something. It's obeying and trusting that a life of obedience, wherein we trust God to lead us through his word, is better in the long run than disobeying him to get what we want, short term. That's what trusting God is. If one truly trusts God, then they will follow his instructions in the written word of God and, as a result, be blessed because you have peace knowing that your life is in the hands of God. Not necessarily that you're going to get what you want most in this life, but your life will be in the, in the, in the, in the hands of God. And you can't beat that. 21. And by the way, there is no peace. There is no joy for anyone unless they are trusting God. 21. The wise in heart shall be called prudent. Stop there for a second. The Bible teaches that a wise person is someone who follows the word of God. Here in verse 21, we see that a wise person is prudent or sensible which means that following the word of God is sensible. It's prudent. It makes sense. God is not weird. He's not flaky. He is sensible. Although sometimes people say they're following God and yet they do all sorts of weird things. They're not following God. They're following the, the whims of their own brain the imaginations of their own heart, chasing, chasing after their, their desires like a dog chases after his tail. 
People say, well, I'm trusting God, and they do weird things. I'm not trusting God. God is sensible. And therefore, the leading of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian will also be sensible. When people do off-the-wall things expecting God to bless, they are being presumptuous, and chances are will inherit chaos instead of blessing. God expects us to be sensible, as he defines it. And that definition is always found within the boundaries of his word. No, I mean, God said to the Israelites when they came up against the Red Sea, Moses said, what are we going to do? The Egyptians are coming up on, from behind in chariots. What are we going to do? There's a Red Sea in front of us. God says, start walking toward the sea. And so they did. Doesn't make much sense, does it? But when God says it, it automatically makes sense. And the sea parted because they did what God said. And sometimes what God says in his word doesn't make sense to the world. I'm not saying that we need to be governed by the world and that we are to do what is sensible in the eyes of the world. Absolutely not. Obeying the word of God often doesn't make sense to them. So, I mean, if it doesn't make sense to the unsaved or people who don't know the word of God, well, leave them be. There's nothing you can do about that. Always obey the word of God. It always makes sense. As soon as God says it, it makes sense. As soon as God says it, it becomes logical, even if it doesn't make sense to 99.9% .9 of the people in the world. 21. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. In other words, people learn easier if the person teaching cares about the one that he or she is talking to and is as kind as he can be while doing the instruction. We must never compromise truth, even if it is unpleasant. But we should always speak the truth in the most pleasant way possible. That doesn't mean we don't admonish. That doesn't mean we don't, we don't, we don't rebuke. That doesn't mean we don't correct. And sometimes when we correct and we do it with authority, it might come across as being unloving, but it's not. Sometimes people need to be corrected, and sometimes it needs to be spoken with a lot of authority and in the strongest of terms. And that's still loving. If you're going to attack someone with biblical guns ablazing, you're probably not going to get too far. And again, Jesus called people snakes. Okay? Brood of vipers. So there is a time for straightforward, plain talk, telling it like it is. But we need to use we need to use straight talk, biblical talk, and biblical language. But we should not try to be personally offensive while we're doing it. Verse 22. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. In other words, the more you understand the Bible, the better off you will be, especially if you apply it. The Bible is a wellspring of life. If understood and applied, it's a wellspring of life. A growing knowledge of God's word is going to refresh and renew you on the inside, just like water refreshes your body. Today it is 84 degrees, which is warm for around here, and very humid. And I just got done going for a walk in the sun, down at the park, looking at God's beautiful nature. But I came home, believe me, I drank two big glasses of water, and it, down, it went down real good. See, and that, 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 that refreshed me, and God's word will refresh and renew you on the inside just like that water refreshed my body. It'll refresh your soul in the same way. On the other hand, those who live in rebellion and are not following Scripture often stumble through life, sweating and bouncing from one stressed-out situation to another. I've seen it so many times. People like that are anything but refreshed because they're always disobeying the Word of God. They're going with their feelings, and it causes trouble. 
trouble upon trouble. They, they get in trouble because they do something that's unbiblical, and they get all shook up, and instead of listening to biblical counsel, biblical instruction from somebody who knows the Word of God, they go with their feelings, and they commit sin, and all they do is throw gasoline on the flames, and it explodes. I've seen it happen so many times, so many times. 23. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. If your soul is filled with the word of God, it'll be seen in the words that you use. If your soul is filled with the word of God, it will be seen in the words that you speak, which is why Bible-filled preachers make sense to those who love truth. Their popularity doesn't depend on big words or their ability to entertain or their ability to impress. It's just the clear, simple truth that they speak that causes spiritually healthy people to want to listen to them. I couldn't entertain you if I tried. I couldn't impress you with a great intellect if I tried. I couldn't impress you if I tried. So I don't try. Besides, I'm trying to impress Jesus because he's the one that I'm going to be standing before and giving an account. So I just try to communicate the clear word of God as simply, as clearly, as concisely as I can, straightforwardly. That I know rubs people the wrong way sometimes. That's okay because it rubs me the wrong way. Believe me, if it rubs you the wrong way, it has rubbed me the wrong way before it has rubbed you the wrong way many, many times. But then I'm not here to impress myself or you or anybody else. I'm just here to give out the truth so that you will be refreshed if you apply it. I'm interested in refreshing people who love Jesus. I'm interested in impressing people and refreshing people who love the Word of God. That's who I'm interested in, in, in refreshing Because you deserve to be refreshed. You're the ones that God wants to refresh. The other ones, the other ones that don't care about his word, he's not interested in refreshing them. He's interested in them in showing them that they are on the edge of hell. He's interesting, he's interested in, in showing them that that they're hanging in the balance on a very thin thread over the lake of fire. He's interested in them understanding that the hell, that the hell that Jesus talked about is full of fire and brimstone and pain and torture and torment that never ends. That's what he wants for you. He's not interested in refreshing you. You have no business being refreshed if you haven't repented and made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Or if you're a lukewarm so-called Christian, you have no business being refreshed. You ought to be terrified. That's why I give out the word of God straight to terrify you. I hope you just got terrified. I pray to Almighty God that he gives you a vision of hell if you're not saved. I pray to Almighty God right now, every listener, every viewer to this program, I pray to Almighty God right now that if you're not saved, you're lukewarm and you're professing to be a Christian, but you are lukewarm at best, if you're not saved, I pray that Almighty God gives you a vision of hell where you where you hear the screams of hell, where you see the flames of hell, where you smell the stench of hell, and that it wakes you up and causes you to repent so you don't go to hell, so that you can be refreshed, like that water I drank a little while ago. 24. Pleasant words are like and honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. If you want to feel good and get a boost of energy for your body, then eat something sweet. That'll do it, right? If you want a boost of energy for your soul, then feed on the Word of God. The Bible has the power to energize you, to preserve, to, uh, to uh, 
persevere, I should say. The Bible has the power to energize you so that you can persevere when you don't think you can go on one more foot, one more inch. The Bible inside of you will give you energy, will refresh you so that you can keep going in the will of God and persevere even when you never thought it would be possible. The Word of God is a honeycomb. It is a shot of energy for your soul. It is an energy drink for your soul. I've never had an energy drink in my whole life, but evidently they work. Verse 25. There is, a, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This is a huge verse. This is a biggie. Aren't there a lot of biggies in the book of Proverbs? Man, this book is amazing. It is a gold mine full of these one-liners from God. Let's read it again. It's so good. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some people say, listen to what your heart tells you. Are you kidding me? Go with your heart. Go with your feelings. So a lot of professionals say, go with your heart. Mm -hmm. I've heard of Christian counselors, get in touch with your feelings. Why? Why would you want to do something that ridiculous? Get in touch with that little boy inside of you. Okay, now all I need to know is the Bible verse that tells me to do that. Okay? Because if you're instructing a Christian on how to be sanctified, how to be more like Jesus, you better back up what you say with the Word of God. Or all you're doing is spewing forth a bunch of verbal nonsense. Get in touch with the little boy inside of you. Get in touch with the little girl inside of you. Oh, that sounds so good. And that sounds so sophisticated. You pay 150 bucks for that, right? A lot of people would. And they feel like they're really doing something. They are. They're getting that joker rich. They're getting that fraud wealthy. It sounds good, sounds sophisticated, sounds so intellectual, but it's terrible advice because it is contrary to the Word of God, plain and simple. I've heard Christian counselors say, so-called Christian counselors say, you got to get in touch with the person inside of you. Again, I ask, why? Again, I ask, tell me in the Bible where you find that. It's not there. Why would I want to get in touch with the little, why would I want to get in touch with the little boy or the big boy or the present boy that's inside of me? Why would I want to get in touch with myself? Why? Tell me where the Bible says that. You got to get in touch with yourself. Again, why? Why would I want to do that? Because the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If I look inside myself for answers, it's going to lie to me. It's going to tell me exactly what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. That's why the Bible says, the Bible never says get in touch with yourself, get in touch with your feelings, look to yourself for answers. The Bible says renew your mind by the Word of God. If you want to get in touch with someone, get in touch with the Holy Spirit who is inside of you. And let him use the written word of God to correct anything that needs to be corrected. The Bible says, watch this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Your heart will tell you what might seem right to you. Of course, it's your fallen nature who knows you and knows your desires and knows your corrupt desires. So, yeah, the person inside of you, you, will tell you exactly what you want to hear and it's going to seem right. Oh, boy, that sounds like a great idea. But if it goes against the Bible and you follow it, you are headed for trouble. 
Always follow the Word of God. And only follow your heart to the degree that it is consistent with Scripture. 26. He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth it of him. God is saying that hunger is a good motive for work. The Bible says, if a man will not work, neither let him eat. I guess God thinks that hunger is a good motivation for work too. Because he says, don't feed somebody who refuses to work. If somebody is able-bodied and able to work, don't feed them. Let them get hungry. Let them get real hungry and let them start to starve. I bet they get a job. I bet they, I bet they sweep streets. I bet you they go to an office and they clean toilets. I bet, I bet they go to an office and they work for minimum wage, if need be, to dust telephones. I bet they do that. I bet they do whatever they can to make a few bucks so that they can get food for their stomach and a roof over their head. The Bible says, if a man will not work, neither let him eat. And we learn from this that God created man to work and God also created man to benefit from his work. You're not supposed to work your tail off so that other people can eat. Although sharing is fine, but you know what I'm saying. Socialism, socialism is not taught in the Bible. Real, the, the, reason, the reason socialism and communism always fails every single time is because they remove too much, they remove too much of the reward for work, which is contrary to Scripture. Why work? Why work when so much of your money goes to people who refuse to work and you can just refuse to work and get money anyway? It fails every single time because it's contrary to Scripture. 27. The ungodly man diggeth up evil and in his lips... There is a burning fire. And this is talking about someone who digs up evil. He digs up scandal. He hunts for anything that may be wrong or may look like it could possibly be wrong in order to embarrass someone. But one day, the digger will himself be embarrassed because God hates what he's doing. You better believe it. 28. A perverse man soweth strife and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Beware of those who plant bad thoughts about others. Seeds of doubt and seeds of strife can poison a good relationship. Satan does that sort of thing all the time, which is why he is called the slanderer. Beware when somebody does that. They're plant That's Satan using that person to plant seeds of destruction and seeds of strife. The devil hates it when people like God, so he loves to plant seeds of doubts, even about the Lord's character. That's what he did to Eve. I can tell you this, anytime a person, anytime a person thinks, why doesn't God do this for me? Or why did he allow that to go wrong? Or if I'm his child, then why all this bad? Those kind of thoughts do not come from the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you. Any thoughts that in any way brings into question the goodness of God is either from our sin nature, but probably from a devil. I stop. We'll pick it up in verse 29 next time. Reminder to you that you can continue studying the Word of God with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study at your pace, at your convenience, three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. And while you're there, prayerfully consider being a part of this ministry. Help me to get out the Word of God. More people need to hear the straight Word, don't they? If you agree with that, then pray for this ministry and prayerfully consider clicking that Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and give as the Lord may lead and be a partner with me. Help me to get out the Word of God to more people. We need to get the Word of God out to as many people as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can. While we have the open doors to do that, 
That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.